have three brilliant uh, directors, curators of art, uh, leaving us at the same time. I don't know if there's ever been this kind of intergenerational trans uh, transfer of, of, uh, of cultural leadership uh, in a single year. Uh, and so we are here to uh, celebrate all that you've done for us uh, and to express our gratitude for what you've done. Uh, and uh, also with uh, Jared. Uh, who, Jared, we all know Jared Bowen. By the way, he's an Emerson graduate. And as you can see, he was not too harmed by his education at Emerson. <laughs> he's gone on to do great things, uh, arts and cultural uh, leader uh, in the city. Uh, and he's going to engage uh, Malcolm, Ann, and Tom uh, in a lively uh, conversation. So I'll turn it over to you, Jared. Thank you very much for being here. Arts at GBH for the better part of 17 years. So I have uh, covered all of these individuals, and, uh, and I don't mind admitting I have grown, grown quite fond of all of them. And Malcolm and I have swapped clothing. Anne was my girlfriend recently. Tom, you were underground for a while, so we don't have those fun stories. But those are all for the after hours version of this program. But just to start, the ground rules are they only gave me 20 minutes. So we're going to move at a quick pace through, through this conversation. And as uh, President Pelton said, this is very unprecedented to have you three together. So what an honor. But I'll start. Malcolm, you, Malcolm wanted me to, to be the last person I asked a question of. So I'm going to, of course, start you as the first question. I, I was really struck. You described the, the MFA as the old dowager of Huntington Avenue when you arrived. I'm wondering, and I'll ask you both, how you, in, in equally succinct terms, how you, you would describe the museums you inherited versus who that old dowager is today, in your case? A turnaround situation is one of the most exciting things. And I sense from everyone that I spoke to in Boston, and I still speak to, they all felt that in the early 90s, something needed to be done. So it's changing perceptions. A great metaphor, it was also practical, was opening the doors, but then new programs and making everything we did more, more approachable, more varied, more enticing, and above all that word, welcome. Anne? Well, uh, I, I faced a turnaround uh, and a startup, actually, <laughs> as it, it felt. But I think the, uh, the gardener today uh, is, is just filled with a vibrant life that, that ricochets off those wonderful collections, but produces new work, music, education for kids, and uh, uh, artists and residents that I think bring a lot to the city. I think it's a really on fire, alive. The founder used to say, fire the imagination. And that's what we're trying to do, and I think we are. Tom? Well, um, in many ways, it's the same situation. I operate in a somewhat different landscape. We're part of a very powerful research university. We have great collections. Uh, we had a, <clears throat> a rather disgraceful physical infrastructure problem mm -hmm. there. But we also knew we didn't want to turn into a kind of static treasure house. We didn't want to be a closed academic bunker. We wanted to be more, to use Malcolm's metaphor, we wanted to be more open, but also more uh, dynamic and integrated with Harvard's curricular and cognitive life. So you, you, you just mentioned building, of course, and each of you had a major building um, that in many ways came to define your tenures and to define your mu museums. Uh, we just saw the Whitney move in New York. Mm -hmm. it, it always seems that building is the way that we look at art or the way we have a conversation about art recently. Uh, in, what way, uh, in what way do buildings have or have had a role in, in what you've done and, and affected your mission? Well, for me, a building is a function. And one of the things I think that's critical in museums today is that we simply cannot keep wonderful works of art in storage. We need uh, more space to display them, richer displays, and to interpret them uh, better. You know, the old dowager had the wonderful collections, mm -hmm. but it's what we're doing with them. And uh, the buildings become a, a, a huge opportunity to, to show more and to show them in new ways. 
You know, I think that there's been a lot of criticism of the uh, overbuilding of museums in America, but I think in Boston it wasn't expansion for the sake of a vanity project, that these, all of our institutions were really pressed for space in the, in the case of the, I mean, the fog, you're right. I mean, the work that needed to happen uh, at the Harvard Art Museums was uh, extraordinary. In the case of the Gardner, uh, we surprised ourselves when we did a study of uh, what facility needs we had. We just took a deep dive to study it, and I was shocked that uh, we came out, the, this architectural firm, Joan Goody Clancy, said we needed 80,000 square feet to remove the pressures on the historic building that could not take the wear and tear of the <clears throat> several hundred thousand visitors a year and the fact that Gardner had in her life 3,000 visitors a year, 20 staff. We had 140 staff and almost 180,000 a year. And they, they said this is not a sustainable situation. So we were forced into a project um, that was going to alleviate these pressures. Ours, ours was not expansion, it was decanting, is how we said it. Uh, and it, it has given us an enormous amount of space to play in now, but it also has really freed the pressure on the collection, the historic building. So these weren't, these weren't uh, mega expansion for the sake of doing architectural gymnastics. And I, th I think people, a lot of people don't realize now, art museum facilities, they're, they're technical buildings. They're high performance mm -hmm. buildings. Mm -hmm. And as our head of facilities tells me all the time, when we go home at night, we don't turn off our systems. They run continuously. And it's a, it's a very delicate balance. So, I know for all of us trained as historians and art historians, it was a huge learning process. <laughs> Tom, you had the perhaps the most radical transformation yeah. um, with the Harvard Art Museums. How has it changed the culture of the museum, would you say? I think it's changed it fundamentally, and in many ways we had to change it fundamentally, not because of past mistakes or somebody didn't do something, but uh, the old model had really, I think, run its course. And we realized early on that we had to literally take everything apart, physically, structurally, operationally, even conceptually. And the building is great. It allows us to do a lot of things. But I think the most important thing we did was that we fundamentally reorganized our curatorial mm -hmm. staff. And we originally had 10 departments going in 10 separate directions. And we now have a much more collaborative, focused structure. I'm not saying it's all peace and harmony. But in many ways, it's really, I think, it's, it's the great blueprint for the future for us. How has considering art and the way you present art and the way you assemble your curatorial teams you know, Malcolm, you've had shifts in your teams as well. How has that changed over the two decades and t Tom, 10 plus of your directorships? Yeah. Well, one of the things I did that I suppose was most controversial, didn't seem controversial to me, but was to create an American department in which painting, sculpture, decorative arts, photographs, works on paper, all work <coughs> together. And working together, they could present a new concept of what America meant. So we have not an American wing, not a New England wing, but a wing of art of the Americas. And so it's assembling the right team and having uh, the right building opportunity and, 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 and division. It really changes things. You said that it didn't seem controversial at the time, but of course it was. Well, not to me. <laughs> Still not. I mean, how, bad, how would you look back at those times? Or you, you probably took the most heat, none from WGBH and Emily Rooney, of course, but um, how, did you, how do you look back at those times where well, you, well, the, you were put to the fire? Someone said, I read it recently, I can't remember who it was, that you can't have a career without being controversial. And unfortunately, controversy is a form of marketing. It gets people thinking. It makes people more opinionated. It gets them engaged with your work on one side or the other. So you just move forward. <laughs> Does that mean you deliberately provoked at times? I have at times. I have at times. <laughs> For someone so quiet and conservative, I have to say I have. So shy. Yes. <laughs> Uh, and, of course, you've had, uh, well, there were, there were questions your way, too. Would you consider yourself thick-skinned after everything that you've been through as well? 
Well, I try not to take things personally anymore. It doesn't always work that way. But I think what you're talking about, I think there's a whole shift going on in museums throughout this country, and that the curatorial staffs, uh, which had in, in previous generations been seen as very historical and very, very rooted in their particular expertise, are now required, really, in order to serve this new generation of audience to be much more collaborative, to work uh, cross-disciplinary in cross-disciplinary terms, and are really also being charged to be much more uh, cognizant about the way they, re they think about their audiences. And I know when uh, I think that the, the curator is the real um, intellectual driver of, of our missions and that we need to have and support the most talented, cutting edge, mind on fire curators, but we also need to force them to work together so that um, the visitor has more layers of entry, more ways to participate. And I, I think, um, you know, not only do, I think we need a return to more connoisseurship, but we also have to facilitate this interdisciplinary approach. And I think, all, all depart all museums that are thinking seriously about about their programs are doing that. Now, Tom has has being so did I just interrupt you, Malcolm? Sorry. Tom has being a museum director changed. Is it more the business of being a museum director now in terms of how much time you have to spend <clears throat> raising money? I used to tell somebody that uh, I can't remember what the exact conversation was, but at one point I said, "Do you think I spend all my time in my office contemplating objects?" <laughs> <clears throat> you know, as an art museum director, and I think you can both confirm this. You have to fight to connect yourself to works of art. Mm -hmm. I spend most of my time with lawyers, with HR people, with donors, with marketing people. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's not the old aesthetic temple anymore. Uh, museums are really now arenas. And uh, there are a lot of players in the arena. And all of these players and constituencies have opinions. And they talk back. And they, they want to hear from you. Once upon a time, a director was a representative of the status quo. I think now there's a moral imperative to be a change agent as well, don't you think? You talked about ch ch changing curatorial perceptions. Actually, I think the younger curators totally get it. Yeah, I do too. You know, yeah. the old curator was publishing a book in 20 years' time, <laughs> and they could keep all their findings secret for 20 years. <laughs> now you share immediately. Uh, well, I'll ask you each to answer this, but I'll start with you, Anne. Did it become easier or harder to be a director as you went on and learned more? Well, I found it easier, actually. I mean, I, I, I guess I'm not quite as um, uh, rooted in, in, in thinking you don't have any fun. <laughs> that, we'll that, talk later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I think, it, I, I think that, yeah, there's, there's, you know, it's not so much fun to have to ask all your friends to give you money and, 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 and see them sort of, you know, shy away when they see you coming. But it's, um, I, I think that, yes, you have to be more responsive to, the, to the, the audience and you have to think more carefully about what they want and what they're experiencing. But I think it's just a thrill to work with the curatorial staff and conceptualizing programs and finding new ways to ex express uh, relationships to objects and that, that, that all that juice in that thinking is, is, is thrilling. And I think that's what donors want to hear about too. I mean, they want, they, they want the liveliness of, of what's going on. Uh, I, I think it became more fun. First of all, I had a really bad start, so it had to become more fun you know, as it went on. And, and I, I just, I really, I love working with the board of trustees and I love the staff. And I, I mean, it's really hard for me to leave because I love it a lot. And I think that, frankly, the, the longer you do it, the more you learn how to, to make it work. So it is a pleasure. I, I agree. Uh, in my experience, it became easier as I went along. Um, <clears throat> I've already talked about the special environment I work in, and sometimes I felt like I spent at least half of my time talking to people at Harvard. And as you know, everyone at Harvard has an opinion about everything. <laughs> and they're right. Well, I mean, <laughs> part of the issue was you spend a lot of time talking to people who have very strong opinions about art museums, and they don't really know anything about art museums. But you, you listen politely, and in many cases, you actually learn. Um, so I think 
we all have commonalities in that regard, but we also have very different circumstances. I work at a university yeah. museum. Malcolm works at a large, you know, civic museum. I actually think from my experience in the field that the university museum directors have the toughest jobs, really. It's just, I think, you know, it's, it's part of the mix. It's part of the environment. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, my chief curator, Debbie Cow, said something quite profound a while ago. She said, you know, here at Harvard, the minute you present an idea, everybody starts constructing the anti-idea. And it's quite true. And that's everybody's training. It's, it's critique, it's discourse, it's argument. Mm -hmm. Malcolm, was it easier or harder? Well, I think if it's becoming easier, then you're not doing your job. No criticism. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing that's a debate in my mind, you talked about controversy, is, uh, is courage capital or interest, and I don't know quite the, the answer to that. Sometimes you feel is your courage, courage is being, is courage capital or interest? Does it get oh. used up or does it renew itself? Uh -huh. Which I think is an interesting question. Oh, yeah. And I don't know the answer. How about in the last two decades, the notion of art itself, and I was thinking about uh, stories I've covered recently at each of your museums versus what I covered when I started. And Tom, you have this amazing technology right now for the Rothko murals, and, and there's a whole ethical debate that your, your own team is raising about using technology and art. And you recently had the, the Carla Fernandez fashion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. textiles show at the, uh, the Gardner Museum, uh, what you can do now in your new contemporary space. And Malcolm, of course, you have your Herb Ritz show right now, which got you in a lot of trouble when you started when people said that wasn't art. So. Is the notion of art, is it that much different today than it was 20 years ago? I think so. I, I, I would I, agree. Yeah. And I think that even to go beyond that, I, I know when Rax Media Collective was in residence at the museum, their um, group from Delhi who, who are a film, but also I'd say a performance uh, media collective, collaborative, you know, they had a conversation with our curatorial staff that deeply upset uh, our curator of collections uh, in which they were saying, you know, um, the, the younger generations really don't care about objects. It's not about, it, you're, you're going to have visitors that really don't care about objects. They, the, 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 the facsimile will be just as significant to them as an object. And, uh, and, it, and if you look at the performance art and the, 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 the online art, I mean, we're moving into an area where um, the relationship to the object is going to become very different. But I don't think, I, I think in many ways the, the discourse just gets richer and more nuanced mm -hmm. and more layered. Um, <clears throat> I haven't been around forever, but I've been around long enough to see that the pendulum swings back and forth consistently. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I can remember, for example, when I was uh, a student at Harvard, if you were in the museum camp, you were a dinosaur. And there was no real currency given to the object. It was all uh, theoretical discussion. And frankly, I always thought that was a kind of healthy debate, the tension between the two. But now the pendulum is swinging back again toward the object. And you know, in many ways, they don't call it connoisseurship anymore. In mm -hmm. fact, we've, we've talked more about close looking and thinking than connoisseurship, but a lot of the old mechanisms and motors are still there. Sometimes they just take on new guises, especially when you have new generations encountering them for the first time. I like the phrase close looking, I have to say. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've done, which I think has seemed revolutionary, and I, again, I can't quite understand why, is to get people to look more closely at objects that they take for granted and to mm -hmm. appreciate the materials. It's hard to so do. design cars is a very, but to say, hold on, the museum is you know, uh, seizing your attention. Look at this, take a little time and find the beauty in it. And uh, to broaden uh, the, uh, the corpus of what is considered museum worthy, whether it's ma magazine illustration or car design or musical instrument design, I think is worth doing. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've, often, I've said this on air too, that I've never bought a car since seeing the Ralph Lauren show without thinking about design because of that show. You're stealing my script. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need it anymore. Well, you know, that close looking is, is what that, this, I think, 
extraordinary pedagogical um, <clears throat> movement of visual thinking strategies, the VTS uh, approach mm -hmm. to Yeah, which you've museum. been a huge proponent well, of. Well, we have, but I mean, it, it actually came out of MoMA and, and, mm -hmm. and Abigail Hausen, but I think that teaching visual literacy in this interactive way really has a profound impact on closer looking and is something that many museums have adopted. Well, I'm getting the, the wrap here, but I have two quick questions before we turn it over to your questions. And the first one is, and I want the real answer. We'll, we'll forget the camera. We'll even turn the cameras off if we have Promise? to. Promise? Yeah. <laughs> but no, it, not the PR answer, but when you can steal away from your office for a moment, what is, where is the one place, the one object, the one piece that you go to that you find the most enjoyment? I like to listen to music, to go to a great operatic performance. And travel in general, uh, really, is always a refreshing experience. In, you mean in the museum or outside or of the mu museum? Yeah, uh, in the museum. Oh, well, sorry, then I'd go to, I'd probably go to the Frick or the Gulbenkian in Lisbon, since I like Lisbon. <laughs> what about your own museum? Oh, my own museum. <laughs> I, think, well, I, think oh, then, that. I think then I'd go and stand in front of one of my favorite paintings, which is the Roger van der Weyden of St. Luke painting the Virgin Mary. Well, of course, you know, at the end of a weary day, just sinking into the courtyard at the gardener is just a huge uplift in contemplating all those antiquities and flowers. And uh, so I love that. But I, I, I think it's really hard to pick one thing because I find I'm, I'm, I'm moving around all the time. Although I, when I first began, I really didn't have a taste for Titian. I really couldn't look at it. I, I didn't. Um, it was a little too zoptic, I guess. Or, but I have just fallen in love with the, the Europa and the installation around it and the amazing work that, that Titian does. It's so gripping. So I find myself there a lot. I, and it, it's so interesting, you know, when you can just pass through on a daily basis looking at things and they become embedded in your mm -hmm. mind and it it's really makes you understand why the princes and the courts had all these collections to look at because they really start inhabiting your brain which is why it's worth coming again and again to the same remember pictures. Remember the Rape of Europa was painted after the official retirement age and That's as well right. so there's an opportunity <laughs> for <it>. For <laughs> mm. <laughs> And Tom what's where's the one place um, you go? Well, uh, since I don't get to look at art as much as I, I like to, um, I find that when I do have a chance in the museum, I go back to really my first love, which is mm. Persian painting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's something about um, the kind of one-to-one -one correspondence with a Persian painting. They were never meant to be hung on walls in museums. They were parts of books, so it was a kind of one-on one-to-one -one transaction, and there's something about those perfect little worlds that I've always yeah. found attractive. Yeah. Well, I will save my last question, which is, uh, what are you going to do next for right after the Q&A? This is in what we call a tease in broadcast, <laughs> so we'll get your answer on that in a moment, but first, uh, Carol has the microphone. Uh, if you have questions, we have a few minutes for questions. Who's going to be the first? It's a shy group. Nobody has a question. Does this mean I get to go on? Malcolm, you've done such a tremendous job at the MFA, and congratulations to all of you for you know, doing a terrific job in the institution. The key question is, which side of the pond are you going to be in now next? <laughs> no, well. you're stealing my question. Don't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Jared, thank you for that question. It's a fascinating one. Well, you know, for 20 years I've neglected my friends in England, and I don't propose to neglect my friends in 20 years here. So I hope to be on both sides of the pond. Thank you for, for riding the fence on that one. Other questions? Right here. Uh, what kind of opportunities do you see for collaborative work between and amongst mm. museums? I'd like to answer that. <clears throat> I think this is something I've thought a great deal about, and I think the fact that we've all completed these 
often not very fun building projects, uh, <laughs> we can now all get back to the business that we know mm -hmm. best, and that's bringing people together with works of art. And I'm not comparing Boston to Berlin, but when you go to Berlin these days and you can see what's happened to the cultural infrastructure mm -hmm. of that city, it's remarkable. And there's something akin to that that's happened in Boston in terms of cultural institutions. And there's some of the greatest collections in the world in this city. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that's always been missing for a variety of historical, cultural, maybe even political reasons, there's never been, I don't think, the kind of cooperation that we'd like to mm -hmm. see between our three museums. So, and I should also include places like, uh, you know, the Peabody, Peabody Essex mm -hmm. and the List and the Rose. It's, it's extraordinary what's here. So I think our successors are going to have enormous opportunities. They're going to have the fun, yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Any other questions? John Ravenall from DeCordova. And uh, pleasure Hi. to be with you. And I meant to say the decor. <laughs> <laughs> you always, <laughs> Good always miss one. Of them. I, I'm curious to hear. It's often said that with a generation of directors retiring, there's a kind of a crisis now um, in terms of who will fill your shoes. And um, but it seems to me like there's in a way a, almost a never-ending supply of directors moving up and jumping into directing. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts about the, the state of directing and what would entice new directors and um, just how, how you see, what side you come down on, whether there is in fact a kind of a crisis and a shortage or whether you see it as a very robust field with plenty of, of good candidates. I don't see it as a crisis, do you? It's just... No, I, we have known for some time in the profession that a whole lot of people were going to retire about the same time. And what does that mean? That a lot of oxygen is being created in institutions mm -hmm. for younger talents to come along and uh, you know, bring fresh visions. And it goes all the way, all the way down from the tiniest mm -hmm. museum up to the top. It, everybody is moving, and that's a mm -hmm. very, very refreshing thing. New ideas, new people. But there's, there still are not a lot of women directors. Well, at, no, there are ha half of the, well, there aren't a lot of women directors of the top 10 encyclopedic museums. That's true. Uh, but, but you go to AMD, half of where the, I was yesterday. Yeah, yeah. half of the directors of the 200, well, maybe it's not quite half, but it's a, not, because when I started, I there were seven women directors. I think they're like 60 now. Okay. It's uh, about half, I would guess. Yeah. Yeah. I stand corrected. <laughs> and I, th I think it's exciting now that there are these opportunities. And, you know, to be frank, I mean, we've been at our institutions for a long time. And, you know, when you drive institutions through change, it's, there comes a time when you need a change in the voice, right. whether it's right. tone or pitch yeah. or tenor. But um, it's, I, I, I find it exciting. And, mm -hmm. We all know that the MFA has a terrific new director, and yes, whoever our yeah. successors are, my guess is we, we won't even guess who they are, yeah. but they're going to have a great time. Well, as they're passing out the, the champagne, for, was there, were there any, where's Carol? Are there any more questions? One more? No? Yeah. Okay. As they're passing out the champagne for a toast to you all, we'll get back to my last question, question which I'm sure everyone is wondering, is what will you be doing next? I'll let you finish your answer now, Malcolm. <laughs> well, uh, one thing I really want to do, I was just at the uh, uh, Association of Art Museum Directors Conference. It made me passionate to go around many of the great museums of America that I've only seen under conference circumstances. Yeah. I was just in Detroit uh, this weekend, and I'm now longing to go back to see the treasures that are there and to see a city that's beginning to, to turn around. So travel is going to be important, and actually museums I judge the temperature of almost any city that I go to by the quality of the museum. It's always the first place I go to. Will you continue working? Uh, probably a little. I'd like to do some scholarly work. I'd like to do a little consulting, possibly. If I am going to work, it's going to bring me, I hope, a little nearer to the art world. Mm -hmm. You know, as a, as a director, you don't spend time, much time reading catalogue raisonnés or reading sale catalogues. You have other people who love doing that. So I want to get a little closer to the coal face. Mm -hmm. Anne? 
Well, I feel like I'm graduating from college and I've got to figure out what I'm going to do next. And so I don't know other than I'm going to be spending more time with my husband uh, because we've been commuting for our entire marriage. And uh, so I'm going to spend part of the week in New York. And there's some studying I want to do. And I, like Malcolm, I would like to be able to work more closely um, with artists and, and um, projects in the, in the arts, but not to have to deal with the infrastructure or the overstructure. And Tom? Um, I'm a little bit like you. I'm going to take a breather. I'm going to take a big, deep breath. And <clears throat> the one thing I do know is it will be in a warm place. <laughs> 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 this last winter was something. <laughs> well, it is my pleasure to invite back to the stage for the toast, President Lee Pelton. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are. Uh, We'll, we'll amend that in a second. Maybe if we could get, here we come. Well, um, you know, I jokingly said that, that Tom was from a foreign country called California. And uh, what I'm struck by is that, uh, that the diversity of your, your place of origins, Iowa, it's in the Midwest, and of course, uh, Great Britain, um, you say Yorkshire. You Yorkshire, mind. okay, Yorkshire, sorry, <laughs> Yorkshire. Uh, and um, what's remarkable is uh, the common thread here. Uh, if I, first of all, if I've done, if I've summed this correctly, uh, combined all of your, the, the total of your tenures, uh, it comes shall I say it, uh, to almost six decades, <laughs> almost 60 years None together. Yes, I know, I know. <laughs> I, it's remarkable how math works in that particular way. But um, uh, you, your, your, your achievements have been absolutely stunning. Uh, and you've taken your cultural icons from a place of excellence to extraordinary. Uh, and for us, uh, you've taken us from a place of excellence to a place of uh, extraordinary. And for that, we are truly and profoundly grateful. And so we will all raise a toast uh, to the three of you and thank you so very, very much for all that you've done you for us. Thank uh, you. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.